Chapter 52 A warm breeze blew across him as he appeared in a kala. The ocean waves sparkled under the morning sun's light. The trees atop the cliff overlooking New Kasudo were green and lush, a welcome sight after the time spent in the desert. Beside him, Ronson gasped, eyes widening at the views presented. He allowed her some time to admire the unfamiliar view. She told him that she'd never left the desert, so these were things that she'd never seen the like of, outside, perhaps, of paintings and illustrations. In time, they began to walk together. They first went to the lighthouse, which Link was surprised to find empty, save for the ancient oven, which whirred and clicked away at whatever Robbie had been working on at the moment. Hello? Link called, stepping into the building. He looked around quietly, but it appeared that no one was home. He could see a substantial pile of pieces of armor, and weaponry lined up along the back wall, though. They're almost ready, he thought, feeling his heart leap in anticipation. He clenched his hand into a fist and turned to leave. He paused, however, when he noticed the smaller bed in the room had been lowered, and personal effects had been strewn about around it. So, Grante had made it home, after all. Good. No one is home, Ronson asked, when he stepped back outside. She had been crouching near one of the guardian corpses, inspecting one of its segmented legs. Link shook his head and they continued down towards the small village. As they walked, he began to explain more about Terrytown, though he left out some of their honor customs. He felt concerned about setting her off alone across Akala, but his concerns turned out to be unnecessary. When they reached New Kasudo at the bottom of the hill, he spotted several of the carpenters from the North Bolson Construction Company, including Hudson himself. Link, Hudson said when he spotted Link approaching across the town square. What are you doing here? I thought you were... He trailed off when he saw Ronson and stood up straighter. Oh. Link couldn't keep the grin from his face, and he looked from Ronson to Hudson. This is Hudson. He's the one I was telling you about. Hudson, this is Ronson. She's a tailor. Hudson's eyes widened and a broad smile suddenly split his lips beneath his bushy mustache. She's perfect. Ronson's face suddenly grew flushed. Oh, I... She cleared her throat and straightened, approaching Hudson. After a calculated moment, she thrust her hand forward. Hello, I'm Ronson. I am... Very pleased to make your acquaintance. Everything she said sounded stilted and painfully rehearsed, and Link frowned slightly. She had even downplayed her accent somewhat. Maybe something from that Vo and me class. Hudson didn't appear to notice anything odd at all, and he took her hand in his enthusiastically. Hudson, I'm glad you're here. Matheson just split his pants again. Came here since we're out of thread to sew them back up. For a moment, Ronson seemed taken aback by Hudson's abruptness, but then her expression grew more resolved. Of course, I have plenty of needles and thread, but I will need to buy some fabric. Much of mine was lost. A construction company will cover the costs, since you came here to work for us. Link watched the two of them curiously. They still gripped each other's hand and he found himself wondering if either of them knew it was appropriate to actually let go. Ronson still had a slight blush on her cheeks. Finally, he cleared his throat, and the two pulled away from each other, looking at him. He smiled. I'm gonna go, Ronson. I think you'll be able to reach Terrytown without any problems now. Yes, of course. You have important matters to be about. She reached out, and Link grasped her forearm in the customary Gerudo farewell. But you will come visit, once you have finished them, I hope. Of course. They released each other's arms, and Hudson's heavy hand fell on Link's shoulder, squeezing tightly. Thanks, Link. 
and you thought you wouldn't find one. Ronson frowned slightly, tilting her head. Find what? A tailor? Why wouldn't he be able to find a tailor? Hudson looked back at her. Link didn't tell you. I asked him to find a Gerudo tailor with the name that fit the company's naming conventions. What? Chuckling, Link patted Hudson's hand and bid the pair farewell. He ventured out of the town and teleported away, this time to Kakarika Village. As he appeared on the hill overlooking the village, he looked down at it with a warm smile, anticipating the moment that he would tell Impa of his success. However, as he made his way down the hill, he found the village to be oddly quiet. No one stood guard outside of Impa's house, and when he walked up to her door and opened it, he found the house dark and empty. Where is everyone? he wondered aloud. He thought of the Yiga, but that made no sense. If there had been another attack, there would be signs. Oh, Link, a voice said as he stepped down off the bridge. He looked around to see an older Sheikah woman wearing one of their curved hats approach him. She smiled at him, and Link thought hard trying to remember her name. I... Nana, was it? Her smile widened and more pieces fell into place. That's right. She was a Sheikah that once worked with Pura. She was one of the few Sheikahs still alive that had lived before the Calamity, and could personally remember him. Yes. Are you here to speak to Imba? He glanced back towards the empty hum, frowning. Yes, where is everybody? They've all gone to Hatino village. A chill ran down his spine, and he looked back around to her. Atsuna? Nana nodded, her expression growing serious. Yes? Things there have been difficult as of late, from my understanding. Oh no. He gritted his teeth, reaching down to his Sheikah slate, but then hesitated. Spirit. She took a lot of the Sheikah with her? Anyone able-bodied enough to fight? Thanks. He turned and ran to the stable, bursting in the door and startling a young Sheikah boy dozing with his back up against the wall. I need my horse. Quick. A whinny from one of the stalls drew his attention, and he spun, seeing Spirit peering out, pressing up against the stall's gate. Link crossed the straw-strewn floor and grabbed the horse's face, drawing it down to his. I know, boy. I'm taking you this time. I think we got another fight ahead of us. He patted Spirit's cheek as the horse nudged him, and then turned looking at the boy. Now! The boy sprang into action, quickly finding Link's saddlebags while Link saddled Spirit. He threw what gear he could onto Spirit's back, leaving several of the saddlebags behind. He worried there was no time to get everything situated. Once finished, he pulled the horse out of the stable, to the center of the village square. After ensuring no one was too close, he nodded to Nana and used his Sheikah slate to again teleport away. This time he traveled to Pura's home, on the hill overlooking Hatsuno Village. As Link appeared atop the hill, the first thing that he noticed was the odd smell in the air. Acrid. More pungent than normal wood smoke, though that was there too. Dreading what he would see, he hurried to the edge of the hill to look out on Hatsuno Village. His mouth went dry. The village stood, but it had changed since he last saw it. Logs had been erected to the west near the front gate, forming a defensive wall. Scaffolding had been built behind the logs, and Link could see men and women were posted atop them, wielding bows. Others lined the streets, wielding weapons at the ready. The northern side of the town was much less heavily defended. Sections of the wall had been erected here. But the nature of Hatsuno Village, a town built on hills and cliffs, like large steps, made it much more difficult to build a consistent wall here, where the village was broken into so many levels of varying heights. Where there wasn't a full wall, however, Link saw rows of spikes shoved into the ground, facing out, and boards and other materials used to make barricades. Several of the buildings here had burned, now no more than charred timbers, including the large villa that once belonged to the village mayor. And beyond the village, 
there were monsters. A massive force of them. The source of the awful smell on the breeze. There were hundreds of cook fires, which burned various kinds of meat, as well as the countless unwashed bodies of Bokoblins, Moblins, and Lazolfos. They were mostly to the west, just outside of the front gate, but there was a large number of them to the north as well, occupying places once reserved for rice paddies and other farms. A distant horn sounded, and he watched as archers raced to the wall's edge. They began launching volleys down toward the monsters, but were forced to duck under the wall as arrows shot back up towards them. Some of the arrows sported flaming tips. A large number of men and women raced forward to press up against the gate, but the wood shook violently, as if struck by heavy blows on the other side. Finally, one of the twin doors burst open, throwing the defenders back to the ground. Others raced forward, wielding swords and hammers, as well as improvised weapons such as farm tools and sharpened sticks. Link didn't hesitate any longer. Standing beside Spirit, he quickly teleported himself back down the hill, appearing at the Sheikah Shrine within town. The acrid smell and sounds of battle became far more oppressive as he reappeared. People yelled and screamed, metal clanged. Some raced towards the wall, while others fled. He mounted Spirit, pulling his shield and Master Sword free, and then rode out onto the Central Avenue. Several people cried out when they saw him, stumbling out of his way. He ignored them, and kicked Spirit into a gallop towards the sounds of battle. He pulled up short, however, when he saw who fought there. A contingent of Zora, Sedan at their head, fell upon a group of Bokoblins that had tried to ride into the city on horseback, along with several Moblins wielding logs like battering rams. The Zora's heights negated much of the advantage that the Bokoblins had on horseback, and they fought to slow the tide of monsters pressing into the village through the single open gate. Sidon, in particular, fought with brutal efficiency. He spun the light-scale trident, slamming its haft into a Bokoblin's head and knocking it from its horse, and then he rammed the trident's forked end into another Bokoblin's chest. He whirled, reversing his grip on the trident, and hefted the impaled goblin off of its horse, over his head, and directly into a group of monsters trying to get into the village. Shadows passed overhead, and Link looked up in surprise to see a group of Rito flying in formation just over the rooftops. They passed over the wall and released bags that they had held in their talons. Their contents fell onto the monsters still outside, and Link heard heavy thumps of explosives. The explosions were joined by a low rumble from further up the village. Confused, Link turned in his saddle and released a cry of surprise when he saw Gorons rolling quickly down the main street, scattering townspeople. Spirit danced nervously, but they passed by without incident, arriving at the gate a moment later. They threw the gate closed against the press of monsters outside, using their superior mass and strength to hold it, while Hylians and Sheikah atop the wall fired volleys of arrows down. In minutes, it was over. People began to gather up the dead monsters, and the Zora gathered around each other, checking for wounds. Link sheathed the master sword and dismounted, walking towards the group of Zora. Sedan stood just a little taller than the rest of them, and saw Link first. His eyes widened and he quickly shoved past Gaddison and Ravon. Link! The other Zora turned, as did many of the other people still around. Sedan handed off his trident and ran up the path toward Link, grabbing his hand and shaking it enthusiastically. It's wonderful to see you again, Sedan said, grinning broadly and showing rows of sharp teeth. I'd heard you were back from the dead again, but you were already gone when we got here. Link didn't know what to say for a moment, and simply allowed his arm to be shaken. Finally, he said, Sedan, I didn't... You're here? Well, of course we are. You asked us to help. Link! Another, younger voice rang out, and Link turned in confusion to see Yonobo rushing toward him. Yonobo was all Link could get out before the Gron swept Link up into a back-breaking hug that knocked all the breath from his lungs. I knew you'd show up here eventually, the young Goron said, grinning as he set Link back down. Just in time, too. Sedan laughed and set a hand on Yonobo's shoulder. Let him breathe. I think he is still getting his fins adjusted to the current. 
Link shook his head, still struggling to find words. Yet before he could say anything, a shadow passed overhead, and a blast of air blew against him. Teba landed beside Zyanobo, with a flare of his wings. He rose and smirked in that typical Rito fashion. About damn time you showed up. Teba, you... You're all here. Link felt overwhelmed. You all came to help. Sidon laughed. Of course we did. You saved our people. So why wouldn't we help save yours? And I told you that I would be coming, Yanobo said, frowning. I know, I know, I asked you both for help, but you... Link trailed off, looking at Teba. He hadn't asked the Rito to assist Hatano village. It hadn't even crossed his mind at the time. Teba shrugged. Cass told me about the problems you were having over here. So I brought some warriors after I took care of that wolfo problem. They had all come. He'd asked for help. And they'd come. Why did that feel so strange to him? Thank you. Thank you. The village looks... Things are going well? We can talk about that in a bit, Sidon said. But first, tell us the news. We were told that you'd gone to the desert to free the final divine. Did you do it? Inoba blurted out. Link nodded, heart swelling. It's already on its way to central Hyrule. I was going to make my way to the others and start telling them to prepare as well. Sidon pounded his fist into his other palm, laughing. Excellent. It's time then. We'll destroy that creature once and for all. Yeah, it is. Link looked around at the growing crowd of onlookers. Zora, Gorons, Rito, Hylians, and Sheikah. All watching him. Many of them spoke excitedly to their neighbors. He stood a little bit taller. But I think we need to take care of Hotno Village first. A rumble of excitement followed those words, especially among the Hylians, who appeared to be the most harried of the group. The excited Munrins rippled out from Link's words in a wave, and he again felt the burden of these people's hopes on his shoulders. It's almost over, he told himself. Well, the Zora Prince said, smiling. I suppose we'd better get you to the headquarters then. I believe there are some people there that will want to speak with you. They entered the inn which had been converted into a kind of makeshift military headquarters. Many of the tables had been swept aside, and Link saw that a diagram of the village and the surrounding hills had been created on the floor, using various materials, such as red-colored cloth to represent the monster army, and overturned wooden cups for the village buildings. There was an eclectic mix of people in the inn. Link saw Sergeant Sagan, of the Sora, standing over the map, rubbing his pointed chin. He was joined by his son Baz, who looked up in surprise when Sedan entered with Link. Link! Others in the room spun to face him. In addition to the Zora, there were Rito warriors and older Gorons in the room, as well as Hylians and Shika, including Dorian and Kato. He met their eyes, and then his eyes fell on the short form of Impa between them, who looked at him with hopeful eyes. So kind of you to join us, she said, voice scrabbly. He could hear the tension there, hidden just beneath the surface. Is it? Link smiled. He couldn't help it. The Yiga clan has been defeated. Doran's eyes opened wide. And Boris is free. She's already on her way to the castle. Impa closed her eyes, releasing a shaky sigh. Her wrinkled lips spread to form a wide smile. You wonderful man. You've done it. She turned, walking around the map, shooing people out of her way as she did so. Link met her halfway, bending down and embracing Impa. They remained like that for a time before she pulled back, wiping her eyes. It's time, then. Time to finish this. Link shook his head, eyes drawing to the map on the floor. Tell me what's happening here first. She looked up at him, eyes searching, and he gave her a reassuring smile. We've got time, Impa. I've spoken to Zelda. She's holding for now. The oldest Sheikah woman nodded. 
Good. That is for the best, then. I believe Pura and Robbie will be returning today with an update. She feels that she is close. Link's heart lifted. The Guardians. If they could eliminate the Guardian threat without the army, then perhaps it would just come down to Link against Ganon. No one else would have to perish. Impa nodded. Indeed. Her expression grew grave. But Link... Things here are... Grim. She turned to Sagan, nodding. Sagan will give you the details. Link glanced up at him, smiling wryly, despite the circumstances. The last he'd seen Sagan, the old Zora hadn't even been able to look at him, for shame over how he'd treated Link. It's good to see you too, Sagan. What's happening? Sagan nodded and began to explain. Well, as you can see here, this is your Hatino village. He used a long stick to indicate the village's boundaries. We have walls and other defenses here and here. He indicated the western and northern boundaries. The south was protected by mountains and steep cliffs. And the enemy forces are here. He drew his stick along a swath of red cloth that stretched along the western and northern boundary. They have been consistently pushing closer with each raid. He began to indicate other locations behind the red cloth. They overwhelmed our defenses here, and here. And now they're camped just outside the gate. Exactly. And they set up defenses on their own, preventing the larger body of Zora forces from reaching the village. The passes and river are very narrow to the northwest, and they've been able to successfully block our reinforcements. What about the Sheik's Slate? Link asked, frowning. We've used Paras to ferry groups here, Impa said, stepping up beside him. But those Zora aren't near any shrines. They'll have to turn back and travel all the way to Kakarika Village. And she still needs it for her research, too. Right now, they are serving another purpose, Sagan said. The attacks on Hatino slowed when they arrived. The enemy knows that. Once they commit to an all-out attack, our reinforcements will attempt to break through their defenses and attack them from behind. So that's good, isn't it? Link asked, frowning. Sagan grimaced. We don't know. The monsters, they have acquired shock arrows. We don't know how many they have, but they have used them each time our forces have attempted. Link pursed his lips. Of course. The stalemate has helped, however. Sagan said, glancing towards Teba and nodding. The Rito arrived only two days ago, and have been hurrying the enemy forces from the air. But recently, some Lizofos have been spotted in the bay to the east, we believe they will try to attack us from that direction soon. Link stared down at the map for a long time, frowning. How many are there? At least two thousand. Probably more. They appear to still be receiving reinforcements. Two thousand? How did they grow so large? He looked at Sagan. And how many do we have? Sagan grimaced. Five hundred. Close to a thousand with the reinforcements. Link released a heavy breath and closed his eyes tightly for a moment. They were outnumbered two to one. It wasn't as terrible as he feared, but it would be devastating, either way. Even if they were victorious, their forces would be decimated. Many people would die. People that he should be able to protect. He opened his eyes and looked at Impa. The Garuda will support us. They've got a large army. We can send some, some women, to go talk to them. I'm sure they'll send support. Impa nodded, smiling tightly. That would help. The Garuda were a warrior race, more so than any of the others. But this would be unfamiliar ground to them, and there would still be the issue of moving more than five or ten at a time. Link pulled the Sheikah slate off his belt and handed it to her. Send someone now. Try to get Captain Teak to join us immediately. She commands the Grudo armies. Impa nodded, taking the slate and walking off to find someone to send. He looked back down at the map, but realized with frustration that he was not a military tactician. He was a fighter, a warrior, more capable in combat than perhaps anyone else alive. But he had never commanded armies. Not that he remembered, anyway. He assumed that Sagan had, 
and he hoped that when Tika arrived, she could provide additional insight. It was a slim hope. Yet as he looked up, he found that the others in the inn all looked to him, waiting. He kept his face still, trying not to show how much this dismayed him. He was no general. He didn't have the answer. He looked back down at the map, unwilling to meet their eyes. What could he give them? What hope could he, one man, provide now? His eyes passed over the various locations on the map, settling on one spot in particular. Sagan, you said that the Lizolfos had been spotted down at the coast. That's right. But we haven't been able to root them out yet. Our scouts only just discovered them this morning. Link looked up and around, meeting Sedan's eyes. Feel like going on a hunt. Sedan's lips split to form a wide grin. With you? Always. I think that might have been all of them, Sedan said, looking around them at the empty beach. A small squad of Zora and Sheikah warriors gathered around them, keeping a wary eye out. It had been a full hour since they last encountered a group of Lizolfos. The monsters hid in a series of caves along the coast, many of which would flood during high tide. They'd taken shelter in small groups, which made them more difficult to find, but easier to eliminate when they did. I think you're probably right, Link said, reaching up and wiping his sleeve across his sweaty forehead. We should probably get back to town and check on things there. They'd been out hunting the Lazalfos for the rest of the morning and much of the afternoon. It felt good to do something tangible. At least, they wouldn't have to worry about being attacked from this side. Uncertainty about what to do about the rest of the army remained, however. Having Gerudo present would help a great deal, and assuming they could break through the block, the other force of Zora could be devastating to the monster army if they could push them up against the walls of Hatano. But would it be enough? I wish I knew why this was happening now, Link said, as he and Sidon walked ahead of the rest of their warriors. Sidon looked at him. Isn't it obvious? What do you mean? You are about to take on Ganon. These creatures serve Ganon. I expect that this is merely a destruction. Link remained quiet for a time, frowning. Like the Lazolfos in Zora's domain. Exactly. I don't know, Sidon. Gen didn't even know it was alive until I went to the castle. These monsters have been gathering since I woke. And the Divine Beasts got worse right before you woke, too. And those Yegas started putting their own plans into motion. Link pursed his lips, considering this. Sidon was right. It was all too much to be a coincidence. Even if Ganon hadn't known that he woke, clearly something went into motion around the same time he did. Or... Perhaps he had woken at that time, because everything was about to happen. Either way, it made him feel that there were forces even larger than him and Zelda at work here. Did the goddess control his destiny? Did whatever dark force that gave Ganon his power work to oppose him? I wonder if that means I'm missing something, Link wondered, grimacing. Is there somewhere else I should be? A fair question, Sidon said, raising a hand to his chin. In his other hand he carried his trident, cleaned after the battle with the Lizolfos. What does your heart say? I can't just do nothing to help the people here. And I don't dare attack the castle without the support of at least the Divine Beasts. It sounds to me like you have it then, Sidon placed a hand on his shoulder. Link. A leader will rarely know, at the time, if what he is making is the right decision or not. He can listen to his advisors, weigh different plans, and come up with a dozen reasons for or against. But ultimately, a leader must choose to follow his heart. Who said I want to be the leader? Link asked, smiling wryly. Sedan threw his head back and laughed. I think you did. The moment you showed up in my domain and told us, that you would take care of our problems better than any of us could. I did not. Perhaps not with those words, but I assure you that is exactly what you did. 
I don't fault you for it, though. You were right. Link sighed softly and shook his head. Just when I'm getting comfortable being gawked at, they start looking up at me in an even more uncomfortable way. Sidon squeezed his shoulder. If you think it's bad, no. Just think about how it'll be after you defeat Ganon. Thanks. They began up the hill towards the village. As they did so, a distant horn sounded. Link and Sidon looked at each other and then picked up their pace, running the last mile to the village. By the time they arrived, the defenders had already repelled the raid, and Link saw Gorons placing new fortifications at the gates and other vulnerable places along the wall. Satisfied they weren't needed, they made their way back to the inn. Linky! A voice cried out as he stepped inside. Link looked around to see Pura pushing through a thin crowd towards him. It took him a moment to recognize her. He was used to seeing her in an adult's body, though he did suppose she looked identical now to how she did in his memories. She was followed by Robbie, his hair more frazzled than usual, and Paya, who was dressed in sleek garb similar to that of what she wore when they went to save Impa wielding a curved sword. She reached up and lowered her mask, smiling when she saw Link. Ha! Robbie said, grinning as he pushed past Pura, who shot him a glare and rushed to Link, grabbing his hand with his own hand. We just heard the news! The final divine beast has been freed! It has, Link confirmed, smiling at the shorter man. But what about you and Pura? What did you find out? Can you control the guardians? Robbie's face fell, and so did Link's hopes. Pura sighed as she stepped up to them. We're so close. My theory was right, the towers were used to control the guardians. But it's even more complex than I originally feared. Give me another month or two, and I could have it cracked. I don't know if we have another month or two, Pura. She snapped her fingers irritably. Snap! You think I don't know that? But this isn't like waving a sword around. It takes a lot more finesse and thought than you... Pyre reached out, placing a calming hand on Pura's shoulder, and her mouth snapped shut. Robbie gave Link a pained smile. We might be able to cause some disruption to some of their low-level functions. Make them more erratic. It will probably be the best that we can do. That and outfit a hundred or so with special weaponry. I also have about twenty suits of armor. Link nodded, feeling the burden of responsibility and leadership falling on him once again. He looked up, seeing the eyes of several in the inn on him. Paya and Impa both watched him expectantly. Teba was there, wings crossed. At some point, Cass had arrived as well, smiling warmly. Yanobo looked nervous, but stood tall nonetheless. And Riju... Riju? The Gerudo chief smirked at him. She was joined by Buliara and Captain Tika, along with several other Gerudo. The room was getting quite full. I figured that since you took care of an enemy for me, I would come along and see if I could help with an army of yours. Riju reached down and patted the Thunderhelm, which rested against her hip. Link reached up, rubbing his neck. I'm not sure if I can say I took care of the Yiga for you, I just sowed some chaos and... He trailed off, his hand lowering slowly. Link? He'd sown chaos. He'd freed a prisoner, killed their leader, and burned their research, their guardian research. Pura, he said, frowning. Did you know that the Yiga were studying guardians as well? What? They were studying guardians as well. They were even building a new one. That is concerning, Impa said, frowning. We assume that the Yiga must have lost their technology as well, since they no longer use it. Snap! I wish I could have seen some of that. If they're building a new one, I destroyed it. The Guardian, their research. Of course you did! Pura shot him a dirty look. Link met her eyes. Except for what I was able to take with me. The Sheikah scientist's eyes widened. You... Do you think... I don't know, Pura. I couldn't make sense of any of it. It had to do with Guardians, though. And I have Zelda's old research notes as well. Pura gasped sharply. A grin appeared on her lips, and she prepared to speak. However, at that moment, 
horns began to sound outside again. The room fell silent as all turned towards the door. Another raid? Yonobo asked, groaning softly. Sidon shook his head as another horn called, followed by another. No. Not a raid. <laughs>